Thank you for that warm introduction, and I would like to thank the conference committee for inviting me to share today. In 1997, I created my blog sitting in a conference, in a session at a conference, a tech ed conference, where I had two teachers in front of the room talking about how they created their own blogs. In 1997, I learned about VoiceThread and how to use it from an art historian who had a blog and wrote a blog post about VoiceThread. Her name is Beth Harris, and she's now the director of digital media for the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I learned podcasting in 1997 from Donna Eyestone in a variety of ways, who shares her expertise in desktop seminars, pre-conference workshops, classes, as well as um, her books that she now has published on uh, Smashwords, right? And, but, which is another tool I learned about from Donna, who shared that with me. I learned Twitter through a variety of blog posts and guides that are shared openly online. I learned about women artists in Latin America and how to buy their online how, how to buy their work online to support their livelihood and community through a wiki that one of my students created for one of my classes. I learned from Seth Godin. I learned from Seth Godin, who's a marketing guru. I learn from him every single morning through a brief blog post that is delivered into my email box and I pick up my iPhone or my iPad, which is right next to my bed, and I read those every morning before I get out, get out of bed, and they inspire me. I learn, I learn every day from the hundreds of Twitter users I follow and the individuals who contact me through my blog or after a presentation like this one. And it's amazing to me how many people I meet in three dimensions who I've never met before but come to me and say, I've been to your blog. I learned this, I downloaded this, thank you for sharing it with the Creative Commons license because I use it with my students. And I learned from Anya Kamenetz, Sir Ken Robinson, and many other well-known individuals that were shared through Steve Hargadon's Future of Education series, which is free. And he has um, you know, several of these amazing interviews every week in Blackboard Collaborate that he archives and are also available at any other time. And by the way, many of those were while I was at the gym listening to them on my phone. So that's a little bit about how that short tale has inspired me. And I think one of the reasons why it is so important to think about sharing and continuing to create content even though we are in content overload mode, right? What I find really important in this conversation is how online learning is going to continue to transform what we do on campus with our students, okay? And that's really what I'm going to get to in this presentation. And this is a quote by Clayton Christensen. He says, at first, online learning was most often used for distance learning. Increasingly, however, online learning is being implemented in brick and mortar schools in what is called blended learning. The content is becoming more and more robust for individual learners so that it motivates students to engage in deeper learning. And the communication technology is enhancing the ability of teachers and students to interact. And that is exactly what I think I have been striving to do in my own teaching and what I hope to demonstrate to you. And I know that many of you that have taken classes with me as you learn about online teaching, you go, oh, and I could do this in my own campus class, right? How could, how could those two merge? It's hard to figure that out, isn't it? You kind of see it and you get the feeling, but how do you make it work? So how do we get there? How do we get there? There is no one single path. We're all going to get there in our own unique way, depending on your style, what you're comfortable doing, depending on your discipline. And that's really important to recognize. But I believe that you need to see models. You need to see examples, or else it can get frustrating and very difficult. And that's where sharing comes into play. I remember actually a student coming to me and telling me about YouTube, and I thought in my head, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> It's just a big empty website, right? How is that going to change anything? So I've come to know that when I think something stupid, I really need to pay attention. Um, so between 1996 and, uh, and around 2006, I'm sorry, is when Web 2.0 really started breaking open. And again, it's when content became, it's when the websites moved beyond static content, right? When going online as a user now became an opportunity to not only participate and share your ideas, but to create, right? To leave a comment on something someone else has created or to create your own content and share. And that's what YouTube is, right? 
Now, since that point, again, following on um, Steve's coattails a bit here, Facebook has, as you know, about 500 million users. 70% of them are outside of the U.S. 250 million users access Facebook through their mobile device. And mobile is really imperative. It really is shifting the whole concept of participation. And we saw that on the streets in, in Egypt. Um, use, used by 95% of 18 to 24 year old college students in the U.S. and 70% of them on a daily basis. And it's only been around for seven years. YouTube. There's more video uploaded in 60 days on YouTube than was created by the three major U.S. TV networks in 60 years. More than 50% of those videos are rated by other users. YouTube is a social network. 2010, there were 700 billion, 700 billion playbacks. I think 100 billion were by my kids. <laughs> YouTube mobile, 100 million views per day. So again, that mobile access. You know, we think about video. A lot of times I hear professors and teachers say, that video has to be perfect, pristine, high quality. This is the YouTube generation. You know, they're watching most of, more and more. I know smartphones aren't completely, haven't reached the saturation point, but they, this year the, the sale of smartphones is predicted to outpace the sale of desktops and laptops. As the sale point comes down, as Catherine Hillman said to me, um, part of the research is showing that as the price of video games come down on smartphones, more and more parents are buying them because they can give them to their kids and say, here, play a game. Not that I do that, but <laughs> five years old, five years old. So the speed at which this is occurring is incredible. On Twitter, there are average, still an average of 450,000 new accounts being created per day, one billion tweets sent per week, and Twitter mobile saw a 182% increase in the last year. And I know what most of you in this room are thinking who aren't on Twitter, Twitter's stupid, Twitter's superficial, right? Twitter has changed the way I learn. And I know there are others in this room who, who, who feel that way because you've come to me and you've shared that with me after you created that Twitter account in my Building Online Community Social Media class. So um, yes, it has tremendous potential. Three years old. The era of participation has really changed the way that we experience life. More importantly for this presentation and this conference, the way that we learn the way that our students are learning and the way many of us learn now. Some of us hopefully will begin to participate and experience the learning because if you don't participate, this is what I've learned, you don't understand it. You don't get the relevance of it. Participation is really critical. And it doesn't mean you have to be on the wave. And by the way, if that was really me on that wave, I'd be screaming my head off because half the time I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just trying new things and trying to work through them. So um, know that you can you know, dip your toe in. You don't have to be riding that wave. And also, in terms of those reviews, they're really essential because now, and we did this last night before we went to dinner, we looked up a restaurant and we looked at it on Yelp and it had good reviews and we went to it and I said, I really hope this is good or it's going to really make my presentation bomb tomorrow. But it was great, wasn't it? Yeah. We went to a great sushi place in Costa Mesa, a uh, hole in the wall. I would never have walked in the place if I hadn't looked at those reviews on my phone. So the way that we are valuing information, the way that we're making decisions, the way that we're making choices is really about, based upon what we think as a collective, as collective intelligence. It's the participation that creates that community, right? It's the sharing that creates that community. And also on Yelp, by the way, you can see photographs that real people took of the real food served at those restaurants, which looks very different from the pictures on the websites. Right? And also pictures of hotel rooms on TripAdvisor. And participatory learning looks different. In participatory learning, you're learning in community. And we now have a culture of learning. This is a book that was published in 2009, funded by the MacArthur Foundation, which is doing fabulous research, funding, I should say, funding fabulous research, research about how digital media is transforming learning. 
And this quote says, since the current generation of college students has no memory of the historical moment before the advent of the internet, we are suggesting that participatory learning as a practice is no longer exotic or new, but a commonplace way of socializing and learning. For many, it seems entirely unremarkable. And when you think about participatory, again, I'm a visual person, my, my discipline is art history, I need to see pictures. And when I saw these two pictures that were created and shared with me by Lori Burris, who works for lynda.com, she used to be a faculty member at Pasadena City College, some of you may know Lori, um, she said, yeah, go ahead and share them. Um, just attribute me, which I've done. Participatory learning on your right. Do we all recognize the learning on the left? Where does that typically happen? The classroom? Right. And it may not be your classroom. I realize we've got a variety of, of teaching and learning styles in here. Um, but if, I would argue that if we were to walk into a randomly selected college classroom somewhere in the United States, we'd be seeing the model on the left, right? And so it's that gap that I think a lot about in terms of the way that our students are learning outside of the classroom and in the classroom. And I want to show you one more visual that I found really compelling. Um, so what I'm showing you here is a visualization of activity on Twitter following a hashtag Jan25, which was a hashtag that became synonymous with the Egyptian Revolution. And this was what was happening on Twitter on February 11th, 11th 2011. And um, the individual noted at the bottom of the page, whose name I'll probably say wrong, so I won't say it, um, but he, he was recording this when um, Mubarak was just about to make his announcement, but he didn't know it. What you're seeing are tweets. And each little node is a tweet. And anytime you see it connect with another node, it's a retweet. And you see that kind of webbing, it gets retweeted to that person's followers. And that's how Twitter works. I'm going to fast forward this a little bit. So this is the time of the announcement. This is an hour later. So you start to understand how a communication tool like that, which is a, can be used from a, a smartphone, is really starting to change the world and help people organize. This kind of democratization of communication is really pretty amazing. Now, another observation that I see as I look out in general at the use of the internet in higher education, the internet is still viewed as a delivery method. Whereas to our students, it's a culture that's grounded in participatory learning. And when I think about students coming into our classrooms, on campus, um, I get concerned about that irrelevance and that gap. And I've heard students say, and I, I, these are not 18 to 24 year old students, I've heard older students say, why do I need to be there when I'm being talked to for an hour or three hours, right? When I can pick up my cell phone or go on YouTube and be talked to in the same type of way. So I think about that and I wonder if we're using our class time as effectively as we could or should be. And if we're using online technologies as effectively as we could or should be. And those are the questions that I think about. But I also think about my kids. Um, my son, Jack, is 10 years old. And about two or three years ago, we bought him a little digital uh, video camera. Gave it to him. Didn't really know what he was going to do with it. You know, another one of those moments where I'm just going to do it and see what happens and, you know, apply my parental guidance. And so he leaves with his camera and he comes back about an hour later and he gives me his camera and he goes, here, Mommy, I want to put this on YouTube. And I went, you know, <laughs> alarms. Oh, Lord, what did you take? <laughs> but it was fascinating because what he taped, he was very into Pokemon, which I'm sure many of you in this room know what Pokemon is. It's a video game. He went upstairs, he took out his DS, 
which is what he plays his Pokemon on, he took out his digital camera and he recorded his screen capturing a particular character that he was really proud of capturing. He came downstairs and he wanted to share that on YouTube. And it took me a while to kind of understand, but what he was doing was giving back to his community because he learns on YouTube. He goes to YouTube to learn how to play his games. And it's through the sharing of other videos that he learns from. And the first thing that he was naturally inclined to do that I didn't even understand was to give back to his community, to share. So that's the, that's the generation that you know, is, a, is amongst us. And I think that that's really, really significant. Michael Wesch is an anthropologist at Kansas State University. I'm sure many of you know who he is. Um, and he's done a variety of fabulous projects. One of them that he started this year, uh, it's tagged VOST 2011 on YouTube if you want to search for some of the videos. But he put out an open call to college students to send in videos that demonstrate their learning, how it feels to learn in college today. And then what he, all those submitted videos are shared with a Creative Commons license which enables you to remix them. So then he actually encourages the remixing of these videos to create new videos. So when you do that search, you're going to find a variety of things. You'll find submissions and you'll also find remixes. And he did one remix shortly after the submissions started coming in. And this was a, just a still, and I'm not going to share the video because it's actually pretty hard to read some of the text in it. But this is a still that has stuck with me the student who pa painted her face white and put an X over her mouth, right? And that experience, someone who's used to learning through participatory culture, being put in a room and being spoke to. Another part of the video that really sticks with me is a student who videotaped his desk and wrote on a sticky, what is he sh saying? What, are, what is she saying, right? That wondering, yeah. It's, it's kind of an interesting shift in paradigm. And this irrelevance that it is starting to um, breed really does start to concern me.